Hello, and welcome to lecture 4.3. What we're going to talk about in this mini lecture is the four lobes of the cerebral cortex, or that brain bark on the outside of your brain. The four lobes are called the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, and the occipital lobe. There's a mnemonic that people use called Freud tore his pants off. That mnemonic will make more sense uh, once we get our lecture on Sigmund Freud, but basically Freud is frontal, tore is temporal, the temporal lobes come out a little before the parietal lobe, which would be pants, and the occipital lobe all the way in the back um, would be off. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit about each lobe and some of the interesting things that uh, are associated with each lobe. But uh, first, I want to take a moment to explain how scientists figured out what uh, various parts of the brain actually do normally. And a significant proportion of those insights came from the study of people who'd had strokes. So what is a stroke? Um, your brain, as you know from the previous lecture, needs the oxygen and glucose that comes from, that's carried in the blood, that comes through the blood vessels that run all over your brain. And as you know, your brain is a hungry organ, right? It takes up 25% of your calories. So it really needs that blood and the nutrients and oxygen in that blood. A stroke is a plumbing problem. A stroke occurs when, for some reason, well, actually one of two reasons, the blood cannot flow in your blood vessels. The most common one is a blockage. Something gunks up um, the uh, clogs, essentially, the blood vessel someplace uh, in your brain, and so the blood cannot pass that point. Um, and as a result, all of the neurons that normally receive oxygen and glucose from the downstream portion of that blood vessel, they've got nothing. And uh, if it lasts for very long, then those cells will die. Uh, about 10% of strokes don't come from blockages, they come from leaks. For some reason, um, the blood vessel itself gets a little hole in it and the blood leaks out instead of going down um, the blood vessel. And as a result, downstream, the neurons don't get the oxygen and uh, glucose that they need, and that results from cell death. So um, uh, in the old days, and when people were first struggling to figure out what the brain did, they could look at uh, brains post-mortem, which is, um, you see one of those brains here in this slide, and look at what parts of the brain were dead, had died off, um, and make a correlation between what part of the brain was missing and what is it that that person could not do when they were alive. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the four lobes. First one, frontal lobe, in the front of your brain. So that's easy. Frontal lobe's really important in people. Uh, it's more developed, as a lobe, it's more developed in humans than in any other animals and it plays a huge role in cognition, in decision-making, in planning, in executive function, deciding which uh, actions you wanna take. It's also important in impulse control. Sometimes people who have damaged frontal lobes have trouble um, inhibiting themselves from whatever natural impulse you might have towards others. Um, the frontal lobes also are very, very important for the motor system and also language. So what is in the frontal lobes? Well, Broca's area, which is an area that's critically important for the production of language, whether it's a uh, spoken language or sign language. Um, usually Broca's area is found in the left hemisphere, especially with right-handed people. Um, you also find in the very, very back portion of the frontal lobes, you find the motor cortex, and that's the part of your brain that enables you to reach out and pick things up, and it's part of your brain that tells the motor system what to do. Um, and in the very, very, thirdly, the very, very front of your frontal cortex, we call that the prefrontal cortex, and um, that's really where the impulse control and decision-making happens. Um, let me step back a bit and tell you about the motor cortex because it's fascinating. So the motor cortex um, plans and carries out 
voluntary movements, right? When I reach out to click something. And it turns out that there is a map of your body on your motor cortex. You can sort of, you can see it in this drawing, but you can sort of imagine a person, we call this representation a homunculus, um, somebody lying on the top of your brain, putting their feet down in the space between the two halves of your brain and lying back over the back of your brain. Um, when you do that, when you imagine a person lying back over your brain, each point where there's a part of your body, the cortex right under that is responsible for moving that part of your body. And what's interesting is if you look at this little man or person leaning back over your skull, you'll see it's deformed. The head is huge. The back is sort of small. The lips, the region, look at the, the region, how much of your brain it processes just the movements of your lips. And it turns out um, uh, where or how much brain, how much computational power you have um, for each part of your body controls the precision with which you can move that part of your body. So my ability to speak and to make facial gestures and to eat requires very, very precise movements of my lips. If you look um, on the homunculus, you'll see that, for example, the person's back is relatively small. Well, I don't really need to do precise movements with my back. Maybe if I were a bigger, better dancer, it would be a little bigger, but uh, you get the idea. More cortex means more computational power. So now that we know that there's this little person or homunculus map on your motor cortex, we can go back to strokes. So it turns out if you have a stroke that kills the part of your brain that's responsible for moving your lips, then you're going to have trouble moving your lips. If, if on the other hand, the stroke is someplace else, maybe it's with your, over your hand and you notice how large the hand representation is in the homunculus, um, then I'll have trouble moving that hand. Okay, still in the frontal lobe. Remember we talked about the prefrontal cortex? We found out a lot about the prefrontal cortex from this bizarre event that happened uh, in the 1800s back in Vermont. There was a fellow by the name of Phineas Gage, G-A-G-E, very famous man. He was a um, foreman building a railroad through Vermont. And Vermont has um, it, it, just these incredible rocks, stone, hard rocks everywhere. Their mountains are made of very hard rocks. So to build the um, railroad, you needed railroad people to go in and blow up these rocks so you could make a flat level road. And the way they would do that would be to drill a hole into the rock and then shove um, explosive material, say TNT, down into that hole and then light the TNT when it was in the hole. Well, what Phineas Gage was doing is he was tamping down, pushing down, pushing down the um, explosive material with this big metal rod. And he had the rod was underneath his eyes and he's pushing it down. An explosion occurs. The TNT goes off early and the rod goes up through his eye or actually no wrong up through his cheek and in through his brain, the frontal, prefrontal part of his brain, and out the top of his skull. And you can see a, a cartoon of his skull with a rod through it. Of course, the amazing thing is how this guy lived. Um, this was before antibiotics, so that he didn't get an infection and die of the infection is amazing. Um, but what happened without his prefrontal cortex? Well, it turns out his personality changed and uh, he became sort of a less responsible person. So um, it was through studying Phineas Gage and other people who had had damage to their prefrontal cortex that scientists figured out that the prefrontal cortex plays a really important role in your personality and the sorts of decisions that you make. We also know about what the prefrontal cortex does from this barbaric surgery that was performed on about 40,000 people in the United States during the 40s and 50s and a little bit in the 60s. You may have heard of it, the lobotomy or prefrontal lobotomy. And what the prefrontal lobotomy was, um, it was a very uh, sim simple surgery um, that calmed people down. 
so the surgery, there's a, the middle picture there essentially shows it. Imagine something that looks a lot like an ice pick. Um, you, uh, the ice pick is inserted behind your eye and up through um, your, your brain, so the front part of your brain, and then it's wiggled around to cut the free front, free prefrontal cortex off from the rest of your brain. Very simple procedure. This was done on people who were behaving in ways that society didn't like. Um, to give you one example, so we had a famous president named uh, John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy had a sister, um, Rosemary. Rosemary was a fun party girl when dad was an ambassador to, from the US to London. She'd crawl out her window at night and go partying. Um, the family thought this brought shame on them. Uh, a doctor suggested a prefrontal lobotomy to calm her down. Um, and that's what they did. And the prefrontal lobotomy took this woman who was a spirited, fun-loving woman and turned her into someone who um, had no intentions, didn't have a lot of self-awareness, didn't have a lot of spontaneity. Everything that made Rosemary Rosemary was essentially gone. Um, this makes people easy to control, um, but that's a, that's a terrible goal. Anyway, prefrontal lobotomy. Ugh. Okay, that's the frontal lobe. Now I want to tell you about the parietal lobe. If you wore a little cap, be over the parietal lobe. The parietal lobe, the very front of your parietal lobe, which turns out to be right next to the back of your frontal lobe, the very front of your parietal lobe has a cortex called the somatosensory cortex. It also has a homunculus, just like the motor cortex. The somatosensory cortex processes all of your sensations of touch. Anytime you're touched, the somatosensory cortex in your brain interprets that signal. Um, and you can tell from this drawing of homunculus that again, the lips are very big in the homunculus. There's a lot of uh, neurons processing what my lips are doing and very little, for example, to process what the middle of my back is doing. Um, okay, so more, more area in the homunculus, more area of the brain dedicated to a particular part of the body than the greater your sensitivity on that part of your body. Um, some people, if they have a stroke in the parietal cortex, exhibit something fascinating. It's called hemi-neglect. These people, they have no trouble with their vision. Their vision analyzes the whole world, but their attentional processes are disrupted significantly. So hemi-neglect means you ignore half the world. You neglect half the world. And this picture of a man with half of his face shaved and the other half not shaved, he has hemi-neglect. He ignores half of his face. There's also some drawings there. You can see um, on the left side, there's a coherent drawing of a clock, a house, and a flower. If you ask someone with hemi-neglect to draw, to reproduce each of those drawings, so draw a clock for me, they'll ignore half of the clock, half of the house, half of the flower. Um, and we're going to take a moment here. I'm going to show you a little video of a dog who has hemi-neglect. So wasn't that wild, right? The dog ignored half the food in the food bowl. That's hemi-neglect, and it comes from damage to the parietal cortex. Okay, <clears throat> temporal cortex is here on your sides of your head. It's near your ears. That makes it easy to remember that the temporal cortex analyzes auditory sound processing. Um, it also analyzes uh, it also contains Wernicke's area, which is another language part of the brain. And Wernicke's area is responsible for um, the analysis of what language means. So the temporal lobe is involved in 
sound processing. It also is involved in some object recognition, and it's also involved in uh, language comprehension. There's a really interesting part of uh, the temporal lobe that I wanted to just take an aside and tell you about. It's called the FFA, fusiform face area. And it is a small part of your temporal lobe, um, primarily in your right temporal lobe, that is super sensitive to other people's faces. Um, some people, either from accident or we think uh, some, I don't know, something you're born with, um, have damage to their FFA and they struggle to recognize other people by their faces. This disorder is called prosopagnosia, and it's a difficulty recognizing other people by their faces. So you could, this is a face blindness test um, that you've got here, um, and I'm gonna uh, put another one in the lab. Uh, if you ask people with prosopagnosia to identify those people by their faces, they can't do it. So what do people with prosopagnosia rely on? Movements, hair, clothes, maybe perfume or cologne, what people say, that sort of thing. So FFA, that's in the temporal lobe. Lastly, I wanna tell you about the occipital lobe. That's all the way in the back of your head. And the occipital lobe processes visual information. So the, the light information that goes into your eyes goes all the way back to the far back of your brain to be analyzed. And there's different areas in your visual cortex that analyze things like um, color, another area, other areas that specialize in movement, all the different aspects of vision. And I think that's all I'm going to tell you about the lobes for now. Come right back and we'll talk some more about the brain.